It provides benefit to anaerobic exercise, so that would include strength, power, and sprint performance. It does this by increasing ATP resynthesis, and it's also capable of increasing muscle mass. The ISSN has called this the most effective supplement for increasing high-intensity exercise capacity. Why does it do that? Well, let's think back to our energy systems, and we remember during the 0 to 10 second range of exercise, it's the phosphocreatine system. Okay, and think of the name, phosphocreatine. Team GB, who has a lot of success on the track, includes this for their track cyclists. And hundreds of research studies have been done with nearly 70% finding improvements in exercise. It's available in various forms, but interestingly, creatine monohydrate is the cheapest and the most effective. You generally need about 5 to 8 grams per day, and just remember to drink enough water when you're taking this. Side effects are quite rare, but sometimes they can include GI distress, and usually it seems that it's when people do what's called a loading dose, or taking about 20 grams per day for the first week. Now, that's one option, and a lot of labels will say to do that, but it's not necessary. If you just take 5 grams a day, it takes a little bit longer to build up in your system and to see an effect, but it may be easier on your GI system, and after about two weeks, you should certainly see the full effects. Okay, moving on to sodium bicarbonate. You might recognize this as something else in your refrigerator, and that is baking soda. This acts as a buffer in the blood, so if you don't remember your high school chemistry, the negative ions bind with the positive H plus ions and reduce the acidosis, or essentially increasing the pH in the blood. It's beneficial for efforts lasting about one to seven minutes, possibly longer, but one to seven minutes seems to be the range when it's most effective. You can use this one to three days prior to your event and take about four to five teaspoons per day. More specifically, it's about 250 to 300 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So you can figure out that according to your weight and then know that it's about 4.6 grams per teaspoon. Okay, so for an average sized person, it ends up being about four to five teaspoons per day. And you wanna spread this over three to four doses. One of the biggest side effects for people is GI distress. So taking it with a high carb meal is helpful. And again, spreading out the doses every 30 minutes or so can be helpful. We can look at research using well-trained cyclists, and they followed it either in acute loading, meaning the full dosage on that same day, or three-day loading, where they take a little bit more overall, but it's spread out over three days. When we look at four-minute power, we see substantial increases from the placebo. So the wattage increases about 10 from serial loading. That means, again, over the course of three days. Then they got an extra four watts when they did an acute loading, so that's all on that same morning. It's worth noting in this study that the serial loading group did it for three days and then did not take any on the morning of the test. The acute loading, again, just took it all on that morning. We also might find some synergistic effects when you combine creatine and bicarbonate. Here we can look at power output on repeated sprints. So the blue line is the placebo, and we see on each repeated sprint the power output is going down, as expected. The red line is just creatine, so it starts out the same and then dips down a little bit. And then the black line is creatine plus bicarbonate. And you can see that it reduces the decline in power output during this repeated sprint test. Okay, one other supplement that I find pretty interesting is sodium phosphate. It's fairly under-researched, but the research that is available is actually quite compelling. It's involved in energy production. Again, if you can think back to phosphocreatine, which phosphate is part of the phosphocreatine, and also phosphate is part of ATP, which is our energy currency. Research has shown increased power output and VO2 max, and this can be beneficial for both sprint and distance athletes. Another interesting thing about this is that the effects may linger for about two weeks or so, so once you stop taking it, you'll still get a benefit. The downside is, like other things, possible GI distress, and I've seen some people do very well with it and have no problem, and other people send them straight to the bathroom. We can look at a study in trained cyclists that use 3.3 grams a day divided over four doses. Again, dividing the dose is going to reduce the GI symptoms. And they used this for six days and then tested one day and four days after stopping the supplement. The exercise protocol was quite rigorous. As you see, six sets, the first set being six by 15 second sprints with 45 seconds active recovery, followed by a three minute recovery, and then another six by 15 second sprints, but with only 15 seconds active recovery. Set three, a five minute time trial, and then repeating those three again. So this tries to simulate race conditions, and it might even be tougher than some races you'll be in. Now let's look at the power output for the sprint sets. So this is sets one, two, four, and five. Set one, there's not gonna be much of a difference. Set two, at baseline, there's a, a larger drop off. The sodium phosphate prevented some of the decline. Same thing at set four and five, you see better performance from baseline. And again, what's interesting, the supplement had been stopped for four days, and you still see these benefits. You can also look at the time trial sets. So set three, which was the first time trial, not a huge difference from the baseline, but then set six, you see the sodium phosphate led to great improvements compared to baseline. Okay, and citrulline malate, another one that hasn't been studied that much, but is again promising. This is interesting because watermelon juice is actually the only dietary source of citrulline, and you have to drink a whole lot of it to get the benefits. What it does is increases nitric oxide, but in a different manner than the beet juice that we talked about earlier. 
can function as a lactic acid buffer, it's involved in energy production, and can lead to improved recovery. A range of athletes can benefit from taking this, and that can include those doing very short or even extended exercise. We can look at a study using 72 high-level endurance athletes. They took 3 grams or 6 grams a day for 2 weeks, so again, this is something you want to load. When studies use this acutely, meaning one dose, it doesn't seem to have any effect. But if we look here, we can look at blood lactate levels. The top line, the circle, is the placebo. The middle line, the open square, is 3 grams a day, and then the dark square is 6 grams a day. So you see there's a dose-dependent effect, and it's able to lower blood lactate levels. Another study using just citrulline, so citrulline malate is, is two parts, citrulline and malate. Citrulline is also something that is studied on its own. 10 adult males with a VO2 max of 50, which means they're in fairly good shape, but definitely not high-level trained cyclists. They did a 7-minute time trial with a sprint in the last minute, taking either 6 grams per day of arginine, citrulline, or placebo. And we can see that the sprint performance during the final minute is significantly improved in the citrulline group, but not the placebo or the arginine group. We see them riding 7% faster, and you can see the difference in the power output. And then there's beta-alanine. So this is also a quite well-studied supplement. It works as a buffer in the muscle. So similar to the baking soda, which acts as a buffer in the blood, this actually works as a pH buffer inside the muscle. So they do similar things, but actually in different ways. And this seems to be beneficial for efforts lasting about 1 to 4 minutes. And even for people doing long races, most of the time people are doing shorter intervals, and you can see improved training volume and total work during these repeated bouts. Typical dosage is about 4 to 6 grams per day, divided in doses with carbohydrates. The main downside to this is the tingling, also called paresthesia. As far as we know, it's harmless, but it does leave a weird sensation on your body. If you've never experienced it, you'll certainly know when you have. Because it needs to build up in your body, it requires about 4 to 6 weeks before you notice a difference. So as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about the pre-workout, a lot of times beta alanine is included, but if you don't take the proper dosage every day, you're actually not going to see an effect. You might feel the tingling, so people think it's working, but you actually won't see an effect unless it builds up consistently. And now interestingly also, this seems to stay elevated once you've taken it for a while, so I often recommend taking it for six weeks on and then going off of it for six weeks, as there should be no decline in levels. We can look at a study using both trained and untrained subjects, because remember, different populations can respond differently. This study used 4 by 30 second max sprints after taking 4 weeks of 6.4 grams per day. Here we see when they're taking the beta alanine, and both untrained and trained subjects generally show improvements. This shows each individual subject's response, and the solid lines show improvements, the dotted lines show performance decreases. Now we can look at the placebo group, and while we do see a few solid lines showing improvements, we also see more dotted lines indicating performance declines. So when we look at them all together, there seems to definitely be an improvement in beta alanine, but it's on the subtle side compared to some of the other supplements. Preload, this is something that people ask about a lot. So what this refers to, and there's, there's some other ones that do this, but it's essentially sodium loading. There's not a ton of research on this, but it does seem to be helpful for people who are heavy sweaters or salty sweaters or are going to be exercising for very long durations in hot weather. You can take this the night before and or the morning of your performance, and it seems to improve temperature control and performance in some cases. Branch chain amino acids refer to three specific amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine. A lot of people take these because they think they're going to increase their muscle or they think they're gonna, it's going to improve performance, but these don't seem necessary in the context of a proper diet. The reason I say that is because if you're getting quality protein sources, they include these three BCAAs. So if you're taking a serving of whey protein, for example, all these are already included. Now, it may be useful for upgrading low-quality proteins. So if your post-workout meal doesn't have a substantial amount of high-quality protein, that usually refers to animal protein, it can be helpful. Too much, however, can cause depression and food cravings. But on the other end of the spectrum, there do seem to be some immune system benefits when athletes are taking these during high-volume training blocks. So to give a bit of a summary here, we can see, again, broadly divided into track cyclists, so sprinters, road, and then ultra distance, which supplements might be useful, shown as the check box, plus minus could be maybe useful, and then the empty boxes maybe would mean probably not useful. Of course, there is different context for every person, every situation, but this is just a general overview of what we talked about so far. Okay, so now that we've seen that there's some supplements that could actually really help performance, how do you find the ones that are going to be safe for you and good choices? Well, the first place I would look is NSF for sport. NSF is a third party, and they do testing of supplements to ensure label accuracy, meaning what's on the label is actually what's inside, and that the supplements are free of banned substances. Okay, so you can go to their website, and there's a list. You can search by product, you can search by type of supplement, and you can see all supplements that have been tested for quality. Another similar one is Informed Choice, so you can go to that website. Now, if you're taking medications, and this is important for drug-tested athletes, you can go to globaldro.com, and you can put in the type of medication, what country you bought it in, what sport you're in, and all those things, 
and it will show you is it allowed is it allowed maybe out of competition but not in competition all these things that you need to know to be responsible if you're a drug tested athlete and then also USADA and w or WADA which is the US anti-doping agency or, or world anti-doping agency have a list of resources on their website but again these two are the first stop shops for a drug tested athlete now race day planning I've talked about different dosages, different timings for these things. Some of the effects linger, some of you have to do the day of. Race day planning is something I work with people on specifically to figure out, okay, when do I need to take this? We look at the race day calendar. We can figure out the supplement timing in the context of a week or month or year. We can also figure out the timing of the day. On race day morning, do you have to take this or that and what order? What needs to be taken with food? We can also figure out what your intake needs to be during the race. Remember back to our carbohydrate discussion, so how do you get 40 to 60 grams per carbohydrate or more depending on your race. Also mile by mile planning. So this is more useful in the triathlon setting when you know you're going to be at pretty much a steady pace throughout the race and we can plan over the course of 8, 10, 12, 16 hours of however long your race is. And finally jet lag adjustment is something that's not paid enough attention to. There's a lot of things you can do with regard to your food timing, lead exposure and other things to make you feel adjusted on the day of the race. Many people, especially in triathlon, endurance sports, and also things like tennis, are traveling around the world to compete, and you want to be at your best on race day. This is something I just find kind of funny and wanted to mention. People will spend a lot of money to save a few grams on wheels that can make you perhaps slightly faster, but as we've seen here, the improvements by smart supplementation might go a lot farther in making you faster during the races. Thank you so much for listening. Please feel free to reach out to me. My email is rd at trifitla.com, or you can visit my website at eatsleep.fit.